think that that is Richard Wagner's uh, Overture to the Flying Dutchman. Little do they know it's the theme from Captain Video and, and the Video Ranger. How long since you'd heard that? Long time for me. How about you, Al? It's been a long time, Don, <laughs> believe me. How long since you've seen each other? Ye- about a year, a little over a year. A year ago last Christmas. Right, right. Captain Video's been on before. His real name is Al Hodge, and we were together about a year ago on the Merv Griffin Show. Then he was on again as um, Green Hornet, and today he brought with him the Video Ranger, Don Or vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> How old were you when you started? I was 15 when the show went on the air in uh, 1949. Was that your first professional job? No, I'd been I'd been working professionally since I was six. I was thinking at that point of retiring and then uh, wound up being <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, wound up going into what we didn't. Well, I, actually, it was a way to show cowboy pictures was the original idea why it went on, and then we. The dramatic portion of it became more popular than the cowboy films, and we wound up, instead of having 15 minutes to do every day, with a half hour to do every day. Were you the original video ranger? Yes, I was. Now, I understand you were not the original no. Captain Video. No. No, Richard Coogan did it, I think, for the first six or eight months or something. Right, if yeah. I'm right in my time down. Something uh, like that. Yeah. And then I kept going for another six years or something. Did you go to public school? At that time? I was, uh, when the show went on, I was in high school. I went to a private school because I, I used to have to get out for auditions and shows and things like that. But, uh, no, not a, not a public school. Weren't the kids impressed? Not really. <laughs> no? No, I used to take a lot of ribbing. I played a lot of baseball uh, out on Long Island where I lived. And, uh, Would you mention the name of the team? No, oh, I can't say the name. Because <laughs> <No. laughs> I happen to remember it. Well, it. well, that was sort of the way we called it. I played for the church team. And so when we got older, they used to call ourselves the Sacred Heart Brewers. <laughs> what you had to do? That's where we spent most of it after the games. You know. but, uh, I used to get a lot of ribbing. They'd say, well, if it isn't the video range, it'd strike me out with great, regu- great regularity. Can either of you remember your introduction? Because I have it written down. Do you remember any of it? Master what? of Time and Space, Guardian of... No, wait a minute. Uh, Captain Video, Master of Time and Space. I know uh, something about operating from his secret mountain laboratory high above Kansas City. Or whatever. Well, the, here's what I something have. Something about gives no quarter. I remember that. There the was a quarter. In, you did give no quarter. There was a quarter, quarter in there that. somewhere, right. which was about our that salary our at that check, time. Right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, this is what I have from an old magazine. He operates from his secret mountain headquarters on the planet Earth rallying men of goodwill and leading them against the forces of evil everywhere. As he rockets from planet to planet, let us follow the champion of justice, truth, and freedom throughout the universe. Right. Let us. <laughs> there was also a gives no quarter and seeks no quarter in here The somewhere. forces of evil, yeah. That was, that poor was... Fred Scott had to say that every day for <laughs> over six years. What do you remember about, is it Perm's Lycos? Is Perm's that... Lycos. Ruler of... Um, Mesteros. Yes, and chief of the Interplanetary Council. By all means. That was sort of a United Nations. The actor named Tom McDermott played this. It was still, I guess, in the acting business. I haven't yes, seen I haven't him for seen a while. Tom in no. years. Don, did you think it was fun when you were doing it? Did oh, you? yeah, we had a great time. You know, and uh, uh, that era in television was a little more, it was a little breezier than it is now. We had a, a lot of laughs, we had great crews to work with, and just about every actor in New York did a stint on Captain Video, you know, and, and a lot that have gone on to be big stars and things like that. So it was really fun, and, and none of us made a great deal of money until it finally went commercial and the network got a little bigger. But uh, it was a great time in television, and a great time for me personally. Ernest Borgnine was Nargola, didn't you tell me that, Al? Yes, yeah. he was. He was with us on several occasions playing yes. different parts. And Jack Klugman? Klugman. Yes. Randall, Tony Randall. Um, Arnold Stang. Arnold Stang, yes. <laughs> I remember forgetting my lines with Arnold Stang one day, and he just cut me up in small pieces. Uh, who was the girl we loved so much who was on the show? Could George it be Ann Ruth Johnson, White? Yeah. Georgie Ann Johnson, Ruth White. Who was one of the finest oh, act, God rest yeah. her soul, one of the best actresses Neither, I've ever yes. experienced. Uh, Lois Nettleton. Oh, Lois Nettleton, that's who I was. She was a sweetheart. She's made quite a few movies now. Were you both on to the end of the series? Yeah, the last oh, yeah. day, yeah. Yeah. which was my birthday. We all went April out and celebrated first. being out of work and, and uh, my Your birthday. Your birthday's April 1st, if I remember. Right. Yeah. What year? April Fool's Day, 1934. No, no, I say what What year did it go off? Do you uh, remember? 1955. Yeah. April 1st. 
Well, they didn't have the coaxial cable in those days, did they? So you weren't network. You must oh, yeah, we were network. Sure. We, I, Doom, I wouldn't have cleared as many stations as uh, the other two networks, but they were tied in. A lot of stations were Dumont ABC affiliates so that they could choose the programming. I don't know how many. St- we must have had 100 stations now. Huh? Well, we had, I think we had about, if I remember correctly, down around 40 or 50 on the cable. Then we did DBs on the Kinney's. Uh, for probably the other remaining 40 or 50. Or whatever. Right. Yeah, because I know... There was one station, do you remember this? That uh, Because we, you know, the, the continuity of these things is a lot tighter than it used to be, but uh, about what you had on yesterday, if you had a tie on or a handkerchief in your pocket or a, or a blue uniform or a brown uniform or whatever. There was one station that used to take the show and play it on Saturdays for an hour, and they would take the segments... When we were in, this is when we went to 15 minutes and edit them into one hour show. I don't remember what station it was. And they said it was hysterical because our actors would change. We'd recast a part after three days, and in the middle of a scene, a guy would change, or his tie would disappear, or his sleeves would roll up because of the edits. Crazy. Now, they couldn't clear the time during the week, so they ran it as an hour show. Were you, were you live locally? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, as live as we could make it. Uh, yeah. The kidneys, you know, there were no, no tapes. So. Al, did you tell me that the, that you understood there were no kinescopes left? To my knowledge, there aren't any. I don't know where you'd find one. I know. Somebody told me, Jay Merkel, who you know, uh, yeah. who used to be with us, is now with Teleprompter, said that there's a university somewhere in Ohio that has a copy in it, and it's television department. Now, I'd have to... Because I tried to find one. I know when we were talking about uh, going out to Merv Griffith and we were even trying to get a little footage there of something on a kidney, and I call, I can Fred, I called Fred Scott. He couldn't find any. Our makeup man used to have some. Uh, Who died? He had a whole yeah, sequence. He had a whole mess, but I don't know what happened to those. And I couldn't find him or his wife. So, I mean, uh, I have faintest idea. To my knowledge, there's nothing existing. The only thing that is, the only thing that I was able to track down at one time was the opening theme uh, and the billboard. And Benton and Bowles kept a copy of that because they handled the show for about three years. The advertising agents. It it uh, came from Wanamaker's for a while. Originally, you told me. What sort of a setup was in Wanamaker's? Well, that was fantastic. You'd have to see it to believe it. Uh, That's the Wanamaker's that burned down on 14th Street. Uh, yeah, on 12th Street, actually. Was it, it was 12th? 12th. Uh, but, and anyway, the two Wanamaker buildings were there. But uh, Wanamaker, like many department store tycoons in that day, was an organ fanatic, and he had this tremendous pipe organ built into an auditorium where he would entertain his customers. They'd come in and have organ music going during the noon hour and after 5 o'clock or something. And, of course, this era passed, and this was no longer in use. So uh, they turned it into a television studio. So it was actually one large room with a balcony running all around on four sides of it. And uh, we would do shows back-to-back where the cameras, of course, were all in the center. And I remember we did Magic Cottage was on one side, and then we had about a minute break, and the cameras just turned around and shoot us on the other side of the studio. Then they set up for another Chuck show. Chuck Trainum. Chuck Trainum show He's on now the other agent. side. You probably know Chuck. Right? And... Uh, we just went from one side of the studio to the other with the uh, stagehands walking around in sneakers so they wouldn't disturb them. Well, sometimes. They'd be sneakers. Sometimes the they wore tattoos. Hair them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll pay for that remark. <laughs> were there franchised items of uh, Captain oh, yeah, Video? Sure. I don't remember. I was too old, you know, to get into that. So Yes, there were. They had a whole yeah, they had Christmas suits day. and suits and games. There's a Captain helmets. Video game and uh, helmets yeah. and... Oh, rings, so, uh, Captain ring. Video rings. Well, that wasn't French. That was a giveaway. That was though. a giveaway. Yeah. Because somebody called me about those, and I have some of them, and they said to save them because they're they're a camp yeah. item or something. I don't know. So I buried, sure they I would buried be. them in my backyard. Was Powerhouse your sponsor? That's what someone told me. Yeah, one first time. one. Powerhouse candy bars. Yeah. They had a remember that big face of a breakaway candy bar that they used to open up because it was in black and white. <laughs> We used to, it looked like the sewers of Paris when they opened it up, you know, to show all the different layers of what was in it. You know, it was terrible. <laughs> Al is still recognized. I, you probably have changed so much having been younger. Yeah, that's true. Uh, or you, well, you get that line. I used to watch you when I was a little kid, you know, these people who were arthritic, you know. <laughs> and I feel like, well, I'm, it's all over. Right. You were on it for a while, both of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did you did you get into a danger of typecasting? That you go for other jobs and they said, oh yeah, you're Captain Video. A little you're... bit, yeah. Uh-huh. It was a, it got it was very quiet that first summer that we went off, and uh, I wound up going right into a, a, 
going right under, under the golf course. I played golf a lot that first year it was off. And then the following year, I signed to do what I'm actually what I'm still doing, although it's a different show. I signed to do Edge of Night, uh, CBS Daytime. Well, I got really tight with this thing. Uh, I More so because you were the title, too. I, I wasn't. Yeah, I couldn't get arrested. And I did the Army training films and voiceovers and all of this sort of thing. It's a funny thing. I think I told you this, Richard, one time that uh, when I went to the coast, and my phone rang one morning. It's Marie Torre, who at that time was editing the radio and television column for the Herald Tribune. She is now doing very well with her own show in Pittsburgh. I don't know whether you know this or not. Yeah, I've been on the show a couple of times. Oh, have you? Well, I'm yeah. not telling you anything. It's called Contact. And on John Reed King, I think, is down there also. With, uh, He's in San Francisco now. Who oh, is he? Freelance. He was yeah. there, I know. For he, a while. he hosted it one day King. when I was on and, and uh, Marie yeah. was on vacation. But Marie's been there about four well, years anyway, now. Anyway, uh, my phone rang one morning, and it's Marie calling from New York. And the first line is, are you about to kill yourself? Uh, you know, it's a great way to wake up. And I said, why do you say that? Well, it was that day that George Reeves had committed suicide because he said he was so typed as Superman, Superman that he couldn't get another job anywhere. And she had written a column about me about six months before this with the same story, saying that I was so typed that uh, it was almost impossible to find something. And so she called me to find out whether I was still alive. Well, at that time... Uh, Fortunately, things were going pretty well. I had just done some Alfred Hitchcock shows. <laughs> a lot of them squads with Lee Marvin, and uh, things were very good at the time. So I was very happy to report that thing. Alive and living in Los Angeles. Yeah, you know, that's exactly <laughs> right. Reports on my death are greatly exaggerated. Mm. Let's talk about Prince Komar, the festering black cat platter. <laughs> <laughs> the who? who is that? I give up. <laughs> Don't you remember him? Prince Komar. Komar. That's what someone, uh, that's where I have him. of a character. Prince Komar of the festering black planet. Son of a gun. I he think that was our director. I'm he not must sure. <laughs> he must have gotten away. I don't remember catching him. <laughs> Especially if it was festering. I don't think we... Uh... Now, you know who was the, the big villain uh, that was in and out for six years was Dr. Pauly. Was the, the, the he was the heavy? Arch. He was... If the, the, This guy on the festering planet probably worked for Dr. Pauly, so he was a lesser luminary. But Doc, and uh, Hal Conklin, who... I haven't seen him in years. Who played Doctor Paul? He used to get uh, accosted on the street. Kids would throw rocks at him and everything. They came out. He lived out in Levittown, and they broke the windows in his house. Oh, yeah. and they, they actually they came out and they dug up his front lawn one day. <laughs> they threw rocks at him when he got off the train. But he was he was marvelous. He was the archetype of all ten, twenty, third paperback villains because he had the leer, the snare, and everything. The that, the whole pit. Black cape. And the kids loved them. As a matter of fact, if I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, but we got rid of them. We destroyed them utterly three times. And uh, I think the first time we put him up on uh, Metasteros with Permis Lycos to rehabilitate him. And then we did something else with him, incarcerated him for life or, or longer. And then I think the final time, we finally blew him into atoms, so there was no way this guy yeah, could Somebody return. came and put him back together. And we got an atom machine and put him back together again somehow. He was because... a very popular character. Everybody hated him. I mean, he was a real hiss the villain yeah. kind of character. He probably was the, uh, the television's answer to Charles Middleton, Ming the Merciless on the Flash right, Gordon right. series. <laughs> no, he really was, and it was, and he was the head of the Astroidal Society, which was the, real, the counterpart, the... Uh, uh, the bad guys as opposed the to the mafia of uh, you know, yeah, the space, exactly. mafia. space exactly. world. Exactly. Yeah. The Dumont Network is something a lot of people, young people, don't don't remember. Uh, Channel 5, yeah. uh, which is now WNEW-TV. Metro Media. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Did Dumont disband about the time you went off the air? That's why we went off. Well, the air. I think they were, they cut us down to 15 minutes finally, and... Uh, there was, a t there was talk that when we went off, uh, we were the number one kids show in the country when we went off, uh, still. Uh, there was talk that NBC was interested in it, and that Dumont said, no, we're going to do it again, and we're going to syndicate it. Because at that time, we were getting into the electronic cam, and right. videotape was on the way, and then it was never never done. Al stayed and, and did his own show for a while, uh, what, almost another year? Yeah, yeah, I did. I sat at a cartoon show and all that kind of stuff. Well, I was under contract, so they had to honor the contract. They had to use me somewhere. I was sweeping out the studio and doing all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> was television much less unionized at that time? 
uh, after I would have covered you. It was, uh, at first, there was uh, when we first went on. There was no, there was no union. Then TVA, even after there was no. Well, there was there was Afra, Afra, right? But no Aftra. TVA started in uh, nineteen. Let's see, fifty. We went on in June of fifty. Um, Fifty-five. No, what am I saying? Forty-nine. 49. About fifty. Right before you came on the show, Al, yeah. they, the union came in, and we almost we had a you know, it was going to be a national strike, and they, the networks all signed, uh, and we wound up. Uh, I mean, the funny thing is, we were getting some kind of a fee at that point. It was all the actors made the same? But uh, well, Coogan at that at that time got tremendous fees if we were, had a commercial, like fifteen bucks. You know, if a commercial ran, I got fifteen dollars. When the union came in, the union scale was more than I was making with all my fancy fees. So we all got a raise. And then uh, TVA was uh, merged with AFRA and became AFTRA. And that was, uh, whether it was a completely separate body or not, I don't remember. I really don't even remember. But it didn't last very long. No, it didn't. And AFTRA, you know. Well, actually, no. Uh, if we were paid on the basis of what the TV people are paid today for what we did, Oh, yeah. It would be fantastic because we're actually looking back on it, what we got was really nothing. I think Don and I, we made, I don't know how many personal appearances the two of us made, but I actually think we probably made more out of doing personal appearances than we did we on the could, show. We could do a circus. <laughs> or, you know, People would say, would you come? And we won one great one, I remember, was out at Forbes Field in Pittsburgh. We came in, rode around the car on the infield of Forbes Field. We said hi gang they said hi and I we swore him in his ranges and got out of there like we did that for four days and made more than we'd make a month on the show it was crazy yeah, but they gave us this break because whatever money we made as personal appearance was ours they didn't ask for anything back oh, which, yeah. was, which was kind of fair I wanted to ask guys when I was coming down here to the studio I reminded me of one very funny thing which I'm sure you'll remember do you remember the video rangers oath the little thing was written on the card, and oh, then I when I forgot it. Would you? I did this. I will never forget. I trust the truth. We, the, I was you tell the story because well, it's it, very funny. We were in New we, Jersey on the stage with this thing. We were on a stage, this? and there were a thousand kids. And uh, now it, this was like the, the last thing we used to do. Uh, we'd do a little skit and whatever. We had the mayor of some town and the city council. Oh yeah, we had the whole, everybody was there. They all the came out to meet us. The mayor, everybody but the governor, I guess. And it was a really sort of a fancy affair. And they said, now the ranger will. Because I never did anything. Al used to do all the talking, and I just nod a lot. And well, so they hooked true. me <laughs> into doing something, and they said, you've got to swear everybody in. So we had we had an opening line, and it, it ran about 30 seconds. I don't remember. I, as a video ranger, promised to do my best and whatever, and uh, it ended up, and give my, uh, my life if need be was the last line for the cause of justice or whatever it was. And I started the thing off, and you think I could remember that last line? And I talked for somewhere around 15 minutes with the entire city council of Newark, New Jersey. And they're all repeating. Repeating what? every word I'm saying, yeah. and it's not making any sense. You say, eat all your dinner. Oh, and yeah, nice and you clean my club. Uh, yeah. and, uh, well, <laughs> oh, it was terrible. It was beautiful. <laughs> but you did it. Believe me, you did it. But it lasted somewhere you in got out of about it. 20 minutes. It was, it was, well, it was on and on. But I tell you, after that, we were both so convulsed. It was so funny. <laughs> We'd still be there if I hadn't finally thought of uh, give my life if need be. Or we'll all die of old age here. Yeah. New York politics being what they are, it's a wonder they would have sworn to anything, right? Really. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you... they were all nice to their mothers and fathers after that. <laughs> they swore to be. Don, did you have a name other than the video ranger? No. Uh, there was talk of giving me a name one time because there was a sequence we ran that uh, my mother came in on the show. You know, they had the, not my real mother, but the, the, space the mother. ranger's mother came to see, you know, visit him. And yeah. she called me Ranger. <laughs> you know, not Harry, but just roll Ranger. My son, the Ranger. They couldn't think of a name to give But him. the Ranger's mother was Frank Thomas's mother, who was... <laughs> Mona Bruns, who played, uh, well, Frank Thomas, uh, you probably know, played Space Cadet, Tom yes. Corbett. Well, Space Cadet. His yeah. real mother played my mother on the show. And my brother came in for a while. That's right. But didn't play my brother, which was no. sort of funny. Did you have a first name? No. Cap. Cap. <laughs> but then we brought your brother in, and we couldn't think of a name for your brother, which, obviously, if you don't have a name, what name was your brother? I forgot what we called him. I don't remember him. what we called him. 
Harry. We would call him just the first name. I don't think it was ever. Harry or something. But then it turned out he wasn't really my brother. That's right. Was my mother surprised? <laughs> <laughs> Did they ever get into your home life? You know, whether or not Captain Video was married? Or... No, no, we were no. all work and no play. We were just no. There was no too much romance. time for girls on that. No, time. you know, it's like the cowboy kissed the horse. We kissed the rocket ship. That was it. And it was really great. We we to, our sequences ran what about six weeks. Some were shorter, but the real good ones, and, right. and some of them were really good. We, you know, the, I watch what the, they consider, you know, some of the film shows that they do now, or tape shows, really don't compare. The technical end of our show was to, we had the best cameramen and, and uh, the directors. They were quick and. Uh, I remember neat. one time with Frank Telford, who was directing this into the Americans, as you know, and uh, he had just come on to direct the show, and there was a sequence calling for a. Uh, not a pan, but a dolly from the whole length of the rocket ship. From the rocket ship, I guess about 35 or 40 feet long, wasn't Less it? Been, yeah. And this had to take place in about 15 minutes and keep people going through this and in focus. And he said, well, let's cut that out because obviously it's impossible for a camera crew to do this. I don't know what this right is doing. And Scotty, who was chief cameraman, then, said, so are you kidding? <laughs> do it. <laughs> so you know. I'll do it. And they did it. That camera crew, you would not believe. Great. They did things that... Uh, Totally unbelievable. WBAR, New York. Been very experienced either because television had really. No, but here's the camera. here's the thing, Richard. You see, we were, and this is why it was so much fun to do it. The camera crew, the Mike Bloom guys, the cable guys, the actors, everything. We were kind of a nice little unit, and everybody tried to help everybody else and work things out. It was a we had to make this thing work, and we worked together as a group. And I just mentioned a minute ago, you, uh, uh, a boom man would come over. You can't get the mic there. You wouldn't go to the director and say, this is a problem. You come to an actor and you say, hey, can you just hold your line up for about three seconds? Let me get no, there. No, good thing. Yeah. And you, you'd wait for him and you'd work together as a team. And the camera man would come to you and you'd say, I can't get a camera there that quick. He'd say, can you do something till I get there? He said, I'll get you in focus and then get in, but wait for me. And we worked this way. A lot of the directors would say, you get, you get the, with three cameras, which is the normal compliment, I guess. And they'd say, get a close-up of Al, get a close-up of Don, and, and then the other guy fished for shots. And if, he, if the director saw something he liked, even during the show, he'd change his pattern of shots and do it. If something was working better, you know. So that they were, the cameramen literally were in on the creative part of the thing. They weren't just saying, okay, get a two-shot, all right, three, get a shot over here, get a... It wasn't just by rote, which so many directors work by now. And you don't, you don't use the facility that these men have. We have some great guys at CBS, and... Sadly, uh, a lot of them aren't. Th th their talent isn't called upon. They're not allowed to use They're what they can really to, use. Right. Because it's and if they do, if they say, hey, how about this? They just say, just point your camera. So yeah. then a guy becomes a number, and then he's not going to really be part of your team. You know? He becomes we, a technician rather than an inventor. Exactly. Better. Another thing they did, uh, which is sort of, I think, hurt, uh, was to give all your techs the same rating. You don't have cameramen and boom men and, and utility men. They'll go from show to show and do different jobs rather than the guy having the integrity of being a cameraman. That's gone, at least in television here. And I think that's a loss. I, th I almost think cameramen should be in production rather than... Well, a lot of them I mean. are. A lot of them got into it. Yeah. They started there. Because there was a time at Dumont they would talk about that. Rather than be technical, they would be production. And then you could... If you get a guy who's really good at it, you could keep his pay scale uh, moving up pay scale now is if he moves up he's got to be doing something else than camera he's got to go into video or become a TD or audio director or whatever, even if he doesn't want to it's a shame I mean they don't do that in the movie industry if you're a good cameraman you you stay a good cameraman it's uh, uh, um, aside from the fact that it was probably wonderful training for you particularly because you were young uh, Al had been in the business you know for years but it must have been a lot of fun doing a show under those fun. circumstances oh, yeah. too it's hard work it was a lot of hard work oh boy but we, we really liked it. And then I would say two weekends a month, we were out of town. We were going to Pittsburgh. and well, I will say this about Don and I traveling together. We worked together seven days a week, five days on the show, and then we'd go on for the weekend. And I must say this to Don, a compliment, I mean it sincerely, that in all of the time, in that five years that we traveled together, I don't think we ever had an argument or a discussion no, or a dissension did. or anything one way or another. We, Don's a very sweet guy. We got along together beautifully. That's and he said truth. that when you weren't here, too, a couple of years ago. When he was <laughs> I think there. I yes. did. Yes, nice. yes, he did. <laughs> but that's true. I, I, I don't, and that was, that's part of it, too. I think that's why we both look back on it 
fondly because we had no problems. We, we really, once in a while we'd have something with the director, but we were together. Usually on any decision that had to be made, you know, we thought alike about the show. Were you the only two who were on day after day? Well, Freddie Scott, uh, when he, he joined the show after it had been on about a year, and um, he became a character on not only the announcer, but he played another ranger, uh, the communications ranger, Rogers, and he'd be in and out, sort of, you know. He did a very cute thing one time. Uh, uh, Freddie's from Dayton, Ohio, and uh, his family watched the program in Dayton. So the birth of his first child, he was communicating to them the weight and the age and various information in a coded system, which he invented to introduce this Western film. He would say, this is series, uh, uh, let's say, uh, six and seven eights, and it's a series so so under number three, which gave the, actually the birth of the baby. The weight. <laughs> the, and the, weight and the, and the whole thing, which his family picked up, which nobody knew about. Mm -hmm. Did you stick pretty closely to scripts usually? Once we, yes. Once yeah. uh, we had a little bit of editorial rights. I mean, we'd sit there the first time and go through it and change little words and everything. But no, we, we did. They expected it of us. Well, as you said, you know, I don't think a lot of people realized it was a really a scripted show, or we did learn right. these lines. That's true. And there were some funny ones. I mean, really, with these, you know, I can't even say that thing about the festering planet now, but, I mean, we used to have those names all the time, you know, Crago, Blagan, Blagan, blah, 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 whatever, Permies, Lycos, and, you know, you talk to them in conversation, you don't mention their name a lot. The the um, stills I've seen of Captain Video and the books on television, I must say, the costumes looked pretty tacky, were they? Originally they were, oh, but later on terrible. we got... We, we, uh, no, we, in fact, they were designing new uniforms when we went off. You know, it was really a sort of a surprise. It was. Yeah. To the guy who had the order for the uniforms, it was right. a big surprise. Right. I remember what? Scudder Boyd was designing <laughs> new uniforms. Speaking of time, we're out of it. <laughs> oh, that's We've quick. already gone over 30 minutes. I thought you'd say Holy Hyperion. Last <laughs> <laughs> Great Ganymede Grasshoppers was another beauty. I've got to say good night. I want to thank uh, Don Hastings, the video ranger. And uh, Al Hodge, who's been on this program third time, I think, around. I guess so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was here once as uh, the Green Hornet, and today again as, as Captain Video, and I want to thank both of them. And I'm Richard Lamparski, and I want to thank you for listening, and have a real nice evening. <laughs>